Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I, Dave texted me yesterday morning and asked if I could speak tonight. I was glad to do that. And, and I, th- I thought for uh, most of yesterday and right up till about 10 o'clock today that what we'd, what we'd speak about tonight was some of the things we're learning in house group. We've been studying the life of Jacob in our house group and uh, I've enjoyed it. I hope others have enjoyed it learning a lot of stuff, applicable stuff about Jacob. And, uh, but I just felt like the Lord kind of steered the conversation uh, a little bit today. And, and I, I found myself thinking about David, King David. And it says of David in Acts chapter 13, in verse 22. And you, we're, we're, I'm going to read it to you. You can go there if you want to, certainly. But most of where we're going to be tonight is in 1 Samuel and around 1 Samuel, Old Testament stuff. But he describes, the Lord describes David as in a way that, um, man, it's just my heart's desire as a Christian to be, to, 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 to be described by the Lord in this way. He says, verse 22, Acts 13, 22, Speaking of Saul, and his, we're in the middle of a story here, but this is what he says. And when he had removed him, speaking of Saul, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. What an amazing description of a person, a man after my own heart, or a woman, certainly applies to me, a woman after my own heart. Could you imagine? What, is that, what do you think that means to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? We're going to look at some of the things of, uh, in David's life. We're going to look at a few scriptures tonight. And I was reminded in, in preparing for tonight that when I, when I got saved in 1990, I had, I had never been to a Protestant church in my life, other than for my sister's wedding. Uh, I'd been to Catholic church my whole life up to that point. I didn't own a Bible. I didn't, I didn't really have any knowledge of the scriptures other than the big, the big ticket items, the, you know, the big stories and the big characters. And, and I, so I knew some stuff, but I, didn't, I couldn't have told you where they were. I was com- almost completely biblically illiterate. And so I, I get saved, and a guy gives me a Bible, and for whatever reason, and I don't know why this was, but I'm so thankful that it was, you know, you hear that, you know, a lot of times you'll encourage a new, cre- a new Christian to start reading the Bible in the Gospel of John, perhaps, or the Gospel of, you know, or the, the book of 1 John sometimes is used in conjunction with, you know, 1 John, 1 Peter, they, they really go together and explain the Gospel. But for whatever reason, God brought me as a new Christian to 1 Samuel. And, and I didn't know, I don't know why, but I just started reading 1 Samuel, and, it's a, and it caught my attention from the very beginning, and I remember I couldn't put it down. It was like, uh, I just couldn't put it down. What's going to happen next? I can't believe this is going on. These are real people, and, and these things, uh, these things are, are written for, uh, for me today, and wow, it's, it's amazing. And over my life now, as a Christian, I, I, you know, I got to say, 1 Samuel is one of my very, very favorite books, First and Second Samuel. So we're going to go over to 1 Samuel, and so the, sort of the theme for tonight is, is what I want us to think about, is hey, David's this Old Testament guy, sometimes we think of him as, as an amazing biblical character, and I think he was, but I also think he was just like you and me. And, um, but as we look at some of the events of his life and his responses to those events, now, I'm pretty sure like none of us are ever going to be called upon to like go mano a mano with a nine foot six giant, physically, literally. We're probably never going to have that as, as part of our deal. We're probably never going to be hiding in a cave when our mortal enemy comes in and like we got to make a decision like, do I whack him or, or what should I do? How should I respond to this? We're probably never going to see that. We're... we're we're, 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 you know, we're probably never going to see a situation where we, we've stumbled down multiple points of sin, leading to, you know, starting with an accident, an accidental viewing 
of a beautiful woman leading to adultery, leading to lying, leading to, to, to drunkenness, leading to murder, hopefully we'll never go through that ourselves. But nonetheless, we, as we read these accounts of David's life and his, see his responses to these things, I think we can get a glimpse tonight, and perhaps, of what it meant when the Lord said that David is just a man after my own heart. I think it means, as I, as, I, as I learn myself what it means, it means that when we fall down, we get up, and we just, we just have as our mission in life, it's always bubbling, it's always driving us this conviction that we need to press on and chase hard after the Lord. And, and so my prayer tonight is that these, uh, these accounts of David's life, some are bigger than others, uh, but... but some are amazingly uh, remarkable when you think about them, that these things would encourage us as we live our own lives to be a, a woman after God's own heart or a man after God's own heart or a child or a teenager after God's own heart. So we know the story, a little bit of just backstory. Um, in the early chapters of 1 Samuel, first chapter, first Samuel um, I think it's 8, the people ask for, for a king, Samuel's getting old. They come, and I'm just going to give you sort of a. You can check up on me later. Samuel's getting old. The Israelites, you know, some of the leaders of the Israelites are like, Samuel, man, you're getting old. You're about to die. We want a king. And Samuel gets a little frustrated about this. He's not happy with their decision. And so, uh, but the Lord, as Samuel's like frustrated about this and praying about it, the Lord comes to Samuel and says, It's okay. Just, do, just listen to the people. They, 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 they're rebellious. They're making a mistake. No question about it. But just go ahead and, and go with it. And so, and so they get from that, they get Saul, this king. We know this story. And Saul's an amazing person. He's tall. He's handsome. He looks the part of a king. Um, and, and, but, but the people come to their senses. So I just want to start tonight in 1 Samuel 12 to remind us all of, of this. 1 Samuel 12. Starting in verse 19, we're going to lead up to the, the coronation, the selection and the, the anointing and the installation of David. So, so all the people, verse 19, 1 Samuel 12, 19, all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die for we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. It's a moment of clarity for them. They realize they've made a mistake. And Samuel said to the people, do not fear you have done all this wickedness. He's not, he doesn't try to sugarcoat it. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. Verse 22, For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you His people. So my first bit of encouragement for us tonight is to just remember in the, in, in the process of us living out our Christian lives, when we make mistakes, like the Israelites made a mistake, and when we call out to the Lord and when we feel cruddy about what we've done, I, I do regularly, I, I don't know, maybe I'm alone in that, but I don't think I am, that when we call out to the Lord, we, we should always remember that it, from the heavenly perspective, it pleased the Lord to make us His people. And, and i got to stand on that every day. And I don't understand it, but I just want to encourage you to remember that it pleased the Lord to make you His people. So, so Israel is now in this era of their history where there's going to be a series of kings and Saul starts the ball rolling. If you flip over just a little bit for Samuel, this is where that Acts 13.22 chapter and verse uh, comes from. Uh, uh, 1 Samuel 13.14 Saul, it doesn't take long for Saul to mess up. He offers the sacrifice. He, he breaks the, the, the law that Lord, the Lord has given him. The Lord told him to do something. He doesn't do it, or you don't have time to get into all of that. But Saul messes up pretty quickly. And Samuel comes to him later in, in chapter 13. Let's go to, let's go to thir verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. foolishly. You have not, not kept the commandments of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. 
verse 14, halfway through. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So we're kind of talk. we're kind of, we have a juxtaposition here of Saul, who's not a man after God's own heart, and David, who is a man after God's own heart. We haven't really met David yet, so we're going to, we're going to move over to 16, verse 16, or chapter 16. So 1 Samuel 16, and the Lord has told Saul, or Samuel, to go to really to Bethlehem because the Lord had found the man that he was going to install as king. He had found the man that was the man after his own heart from the Lord's perspective. And so Samuel goes, goes to the house of Jesse. We can see a little bit about Saul's leadership here and the kind of person Saul was. It's, it wasn't just that he hated David. We'll see some of that in a little while. But in 16.2, 1 Samuel 16.2, the Lord has told Samuel, go, go to Bethlehem and anoint this person as king. And Saul's, Samuel's first response is, but God, if, if Saul finds out about this, he's going to kill me. It's kind of weird, right? But, but we get a glimpse of what kind of man Saul was from that. And, and, but God's like, I got this, no problem. So, so Samuel goes, and we know this story. And he goes through the first of, of, of Jesse's sons. And, and uh, at each one, Samuel's thinking, that surely this is the one. We know, we know this. But, it, but I just want to, you know, when I read the Scripture, I always try and I encourage, I encourage all of us to try to put ourselves in this scene. Because right? the Word of God is living. It's not just words on the page. It's not like a history textbook. where We can read George Washington, Cross of Delaware, and 17, blah, blah, blah. Put it on, and it's done. And it's just in there. And it's, it doesn't mean... Much. It's a good piece of history, but this is living. This word is applicable to our lives today, right now, in this moment. So, so put yourself here. Jesse's got these seven sons. Samuel is there. He, they, he, he's come to, to sacrifice to the Lord. While he's sacrificing to the Lord, he's got this other agenda. And the agenda is to find this person that the Lord has declared will be the next king, the man after God's own heart. This is going to be a special person. You would think this is going to be the Lord himself, the God of heaven, has chosen this person. He knows who he, am, no, who he is. Nobody else knows who he is. And they go through all of, all of Jesse's kids. None of them are chosen. And they, they reach this point where there's this confusion. Well, Sam was like, what? Lord, you, you sent me here to find the king and, to, and to, to anoint him. The Lord has not, verse 10, Sam just said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. So verse 10, that Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Now, for whatever reason, Jesse didn't even think it worthwhile to take his youngest son and bring him to this, to this uh, event, this sacrifice. I don't know why that is. I don't know what, what Jesse was thinking about that. But for whatever reason, Jesse the father chose to leave David in the field shepherding. Now, I don't know about you, but when I, when I see something special going on, I mean, Samuel has shown up in town. It's a small town. Samuel is like way powerful. People know Samuel. When he shows up in Bethlehem, people are like, have you come in peace? Are you here to come? You're the guy. You're like the, the prophet of the Lord. So the, I can imagine the town's in a little bit of an uproar. The, you know, Jesse's family is going, seven sons are coming in. There's something big going on. And yet David, if I, if, I, if I was David, I'd be like, what's going on over there? I want to be part of that. This is important. It's Samuel. Wow. What's he doing? Verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, are all of, these young, all of the young men here? Then he said, well, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And so, I guess my, my first point tonight was that David, the man after God's own heart, what were the characteristics of David, the man after God's own heart, the man that the Lord himself declared was after God's own heart? David was faithful in little things. He was faithful in, faithful in little things. He took his job seriously. And we'll learn this later on when he, when he describes uh, his, his 
his stint as a shepherd to Saul on the battlefield, but he took his job seriously to the point where he wasn't straining himself to be part of whatever was going on with Samuel and Jesse and his big brothers. He was minding his sheep. And so I'd encourage us, you know, think about the little things in your life. I don't know what they are. Uh, sometimes they might seem insignificant. But the man after God's own heart was faithful in, in, this, in these little things. And we see this in this account. So let's move over one chapter to, to chapter 17. And we know this very famous piece of Scripture, the, the story of David and Goliath. I'll, I'll point out that David is still a shepherd at this point. He's, he's been anointed by, by Samuel. But he's home with the sheep. And there's this amazing battle that comes to the Israelites. And, I, and again, I, I put myself, like, I'm a guy, right? So I think of war, I, li- I like to watch war movies. And I kind of like to think of myself, I could do that. I can, <laughs> you know, I could be bad like that, those guys. And, uh, but when I think about what it would be like to stand on a hilltop and look out across the valley to another hilltop with, within earshot of me, and I'm the Israelites, and they're the Philistines. And we're drawn up as the Israelites. We're drawn up in battle array. We're ready. We're ready to rumble. Bring it. And they do. They do. So the Philistines are like, yeah, okay, we'll bring it. Goliath, get on out there. And so this, this freak of nature comes out of the battle line of the Philistines and says to the Israelites, for 40 days in a row, send me a man that I might fight with him. And if, and here's the thing. It's not going to be like, you know, it's not like it's going to be a thumb wrestle. Like, I got you. Two out of three. No, it's not going to be. It's going to be one, one, two people going to go onto the battlefield, one person going to walk off. The guy that doesn't walk off is going to be dead. Fight to the death. Now, you, you, now I've been in a couple of fights in my life. If someone said, yeah, we're going to fight behind this. Let's go out in the playground right now. We're going to fight. I've been there. Let's go in. I'll meet you in the locker room, pal. And oh, by the way, it's fight to the death. I'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Hang on here. Now, I, I, I don't dislike you that bad. Whatever. You can have my milk money, okay? Just, I don't want to fight that badly. This is a fight to the death. And, and this guy's huge, and he's a warrior, and he's like buff, and all these things. And the whole Israelite army is in battle array. And every day, they get in battle array, and they're like, I can see them just bat pounding their spear. Ooh, 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 ooh. Bring it! And Goliath comes out like, send me, send me a guy. Just one guy. One on one. And the stakes are high. Like, I could, I, I could, I could fight a guy. I'd fight a guy right now. Right? But I wouldn't want to fight a guy if he said, well, look, if I win, all these people are my slave. If you win, all, I mean, the stakes are high. The whole nation's fate rested on this fight. I don't want any part of that. Let somebody else do that. And David comes along. We know the story. David comes along, the little boy, the little shepherd boy, faithful in the little things, and he shows up because Jesse sent him with the lunch pail to bring to his big brothers who are the warriors. And while he's there, I'm not reading it directly from the Scripture, but you, you, you know the story. While he's there, he just happens to be there when Goliath comes out. He's like, bring it. And what is David's response? Let's look at it. He goes to his older brothers. They get fired up at him. He sees this happen. And it says this. Let's pick it up in 20. 17, 20. 1 Samuel 17, 20. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded. He's obedient. Okay? See, he's obedient. He's obedient to his father. Took the things just as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. They weren't really going out to fight. They'd had 40 days to go out to fight. They were shaken in their boots. They were afraid of Goliath. They were afraid of the outcome of this fight, I, I, I think. 21, for Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, came and greeted his brothers. 
And as he talked with them, there was the champion, 23, verse 23, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. And all the men of Israel, oh, and, and so David heard them. So David, the shepherd boy, hears them. All the soldiers have been hearing him for 40 days. What was different about David? David, the shepherd boy, heard him. 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So on the one hand, they're out there beating their chest and hoo, hoo, hoo. And then that, that, that Goliath comes out and they all run away. Day after day after day. And what does David say? So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches. will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? And takes away, what does he say? Takes away, he doesn't say, He's insulting our manhood, isn't he? He's impugning our masculinity. How dare he? It wasn't about him. And it wasn't, and it wasn't about him. For David, what does David say? Verse 26. What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? His focus is on the Lord. His focus is on the living God and, and, and on bringing honor to his name. And he recognizes so clearly that this guy, this giant who physically, outwardly looks like a big, scary guy, the real issue, he's offending the living God. Eliab, 28, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when this guy that got rejected as king, but I can imagine Eliab, yeah, Samuel, I'm, I'm probably the guy you're looking for. Really, look at me. Samuel's like, nope, not you. So Eliab is here later on. It's verse 28. His anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I mean, his older brother is just dissing him. Because this young man has seen clearly what the issue is. And wasn't afraid to speak it outwardly. I mean, how many of us have seen something that was just totally disgusting in our mind and in our, in our heart? We knew it was wrong. We just zipped our lips and didn't say anything. David's not that kind of guy. David spoke out. David was scandalized by what's going on here. And he was not afraid to say it outwardly and put himself out there. 29, David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first one said. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. And so he sent him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. This is David speaking to the king. This is the shepherd boy encouraging the leader of the army. I mean, think about the irony of this story. This little kid that brought Twinkies and, and Nabs to his brothers to eat on the battlefield says, King, man, don't, don't, let, don't be worried about this guy. What gall? Let no, heart, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I would have laughed. I would have laughed in David's face if he said that. That's like... Is David in here? Am I David? Okay. I mean, that's, that's, we've got a seven-year-old at home named David. And he walks around, and he walks around, he, he puts swords in his belt and plastic gun. I mean, he's a warrior. You know, he's a ninja. And, you know, he says stuff like, you know, let's go bear hunting. I'm like, yeah, let's go do it. And, but it's a kid. Here, David is ready to do it. He's serious. Even Saul looks, you can't go up against this guy. But he's willing to do it. Let me know the story. He wasn't overcome by anxiety. He was more concerned with the honor to God's name than he was with anything else. And he was completely confident that the Lord was able to win this battle. I, I don't want to spend uh, uh, read all of it. 36, your servant has killed both lion and bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he defies the army of the living God. There it is again. 32. More, and this is the key. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So it wasn't, it wasn't machismo. 
It wasn't that David was some sort of ninja guy with special moves and like a secret weapon or something. It was a shepherd boy without armor, without a real weapon, but with the Lord's for us, who can be against us? So this, this man, after God's own heart, he was faithful in the little things. He wasn't consumed with anxiety. He was, in this case, he was immune to anxiety. This was an anxiety-inducing situation. There's a lot riding on this, and we know the end of the story. We know the end of the story. Right? You, know, you do know the end of the story, right? David wins. Spoiler. David wins, kills Goliath, cuts his head off with his own sword, it's like, holy cow, he did it. It's, it's unbelievable. There's a route. Israel routes him, chases the Philistines, butchers him up. It's awesome. And it all started because this little shepherd boy is like, this guy, come on, God's on our side. Did you guys forget? Army of Israel, did you forget that God is on our side? Am I the only one that remembers this? This is what it is to be a man after God's own heart. To be the guy that stands up in the crowd and says, wait a minute. God's on our side. That counts. That matters. Some of us right here in this room are facing our own Goliaths. Some of us in the room have, have health issues. We've got bad diagnoses. We've got families falling apart. We've got economic issues. We've got all sorts of issues in our, in our lives. All sorts of them. And i got my own. God's on our side. We can, in the midst of all these troubles, we can be men and women after God's own heart. Praise the Lord. I love that. I love that. He wasn't overcome with anxiety. Flip over to 24, 1 Samuel 24. So he kills Goliath. He's a hero. Young, studly guy, shepherd boy. He's an automatic, automatic hero. He's the guy that comes in on the last play of football and he throws the winning touchdown. First, last play, it's like Rudy at Notre Dame. It's like a hero. Right? Comes in, they're having a, they're having a, a ticker tape parade for the victorious army. And the women come out, they're dancing. You know this story, perhaps. And, the, and, and, and Saul's there, the leader of the army. I can't imagine that there's, there's probably a, thousands of guys that were like coming back and like, yeah, we, we won. But really, that kid, I mean, that kid got it all started. He's the one that really got it going. right? And Saul is there. I, I can only imagine how embarrassed I would have been if I was Saul. That this shepherd boy encouraged me. The shepherd boy put, did what I should have done. And maybe we've done that sometimes. Maybe we sometimes look back on decisions we've made, opportunities we've missed, we beat ourselves. Man, I should have done this. But the Lord was pleased to make you his people. So we don't beat ourselves up. right? We keep walking. David wasn't perfect. We'll see this. Chapter 24 in 1 Samuel Tells one of the, I think one of the most amazing stories of David and some of the attributes that made him a man after God's own heart. So Saul gets jealous. The ladies come out and the army's coming through and the ladies sing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Right? And so there's a definite distinction between Saul, the guy who's violent, the guy who's, who's you know, not cut out for this job. He looked good on the outside, but he didn't have the heart. He wasn't a man after God's own heart. And David is just this clueless, godly kid that everyone's going crazy about because he's so awesome. He'd killed the giant. And he's, I mean, David's a bad dude. Now, don't get me wrong. David, I, I, David is, is a warrior, uh, but he, he fights in the power of the Lord. So Saul gets mad at him. Saul tries to kill him. King Saul is out to get David. Right? We know this. And he, he gets to the point where he's chasing around. David leaves the house leaves Jonathan, his best friend. He's running around. He's being chased. Bad deal. I mean, this is the guy that was just a hero a little while earlier, but Saul wants him dead now. And so he's running around. Chapter 24. <laughs> you know, this is great. This is great verse. Great chapters. So, so Saul, Saul's chasing him. He's got 3,000 men with him. Saul has chosen 3,000, it says, choice men from the army of Israel, and they're in pursuit of David the shepherd boy. And David holds up in this cave, and let's read it, verse 20, uh, chapter 24, verse 1. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. So somebody spies him out. Somebody snitches on him. 
Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. My David giggled when we got to this part of the story because we talked about what that probably meant. But anyway, so Saul goes into the cave. David, it says, Saul went in to attend to his needs. So Saul goes into this cave, not knowing that David and his men are in the cave. I don't know what this looked like specifically, but I've been in some caves, and I know I went in the cave. How many of you been in the cave of Wadi? Denise, where are you? Denise has been in that cave. Now I know I know darn well that if if there were a hundred of us at the bottom of the cave at Wadi, Dave, Dave's definitely been in the cave of Wadi. If there was a hundred of us in the bottom of the cave at Wadi, and I came in from the top, you wouldn't be able to see who's down in there. If you were quiet, it'd be pitch black. And so get this picture. So Saul comes in. He's in pursuit of David. He wants to kill David. He's tried to pin David up against the wall with a spear. He's tried to kill him. He's in hot pursuit. He's got 3,000 warriors chasing him. David knows he's a marked man. And David is in the cave. And Saul comes in in his robely, his kingly robe to probably use the bathroom. And there he is, sits down, pulls out the newspaper. He's just... He's just relaxing for maybe a few minutes. And David's men, this is, I mean, David's men, it says here, David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Verse 4. And the men of David said to him, Dude, this, this is like a gift from God. How awesome is this, David? I mean, here we are. We're on the run from the king. We're ready for fighting. But all of a sudden, of all the caves, that he could have gone to, he came into this cave. Now, I believe that the Lord set this up sovereignly, providentially, for exactly, just exactly so tonight we could be talking about what makes a man after God's own heart. Because David's friends are telling him, kill him! You've got a golden opportunity right here, David. It's never going to get easier than this. Kill him, problem solved. And if you don't, we will. Verse 4. And the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. They even quote scripture to him. They they tell him, The Lord told you about this. But David sees it completely differently. David doesn't see. Now, if there's a guy out to kill me, if I'm running with my family, I'm separated from my family, my friends, I'm living in a cave, I'm eating whatever he was eating, and I get the opportunity to whack the guy that's after me, he's sitting right there using the bathroom, and I'm like... I'm whacking him. I mean, that's my first thought. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill this guy. Problem solved. It's over. I go home, done. David's looking at a completely different world than I would be looking at, probably. He's looking at it from the, from the vantage point of a sovereign God who has placed Saul in as king. And because of that, because he recognizes God's sovereignty, and he recognizes that the Lord himself anointed Saul as king, killing Saul is as far from David's mind as it could be. He's scandalized by the whole thought of it. What seems completely normal, a natural response to a fleshly man like me, seems completely otherworldly to a man after God's own heart. He wouldn't even consider it. What does he do? I mean, that's tempting right there. Even your buddies are telling you, do it. The Lord said he's going to give you, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering if he's like, ah, should I? I don't think so. I think, I think David had it clearly in his mind. David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And we get a picture of David's heart towards Saul here. Because, you know, I mean, I, I've got, I'll share with this, I've got a, 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 maybe she'll see this on the video. So Beth, I love you. Hope you can be restored. But I've got a sister I haven't talked to in seven years, six or seven years. I don't know what I did to get her mad at me. I don't think I did anything. But she has chosen to kind of cut me off. And so in my heart, I can easily be like, bro, you cut me up, cut you off. You're out to get me, I'm out to get you. David here, Saul is out to get him. He could have, he could have easily just grown this hatred. Wouldn't you grow a hatred to a guy that's out to kill you every, t- every time you... I'm just playing the, the, the lute. He throws a spear at me. Why, why do you do that? I don't, I don't do anything. I'm best friends with your son, Saul. 
Look what David says. David arose secretly, cuts the Saul's robe off. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. He's, he's troubled because he has damaged the king's robe. This is what he's thinking. He's a man after God's own heart. You shouldn't cut the king's robe, dude. That's, a, that's disrespectful to the king. Right? He's troubled about that. I think, I think that's what's troubling him. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. He calls him his master. Because you know what? He was his master. This is God's providence. This is God's order of things. He was the king. If the Lord wanted to take him out, he would have. God orchestrated this moment for David's benefit and for ours. The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord anointed to stretch out my hand against him. The, uh, to, to my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him. Seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. He recognizes him as the anointed of the, uh, of the Lord. This guy who's out to kill him. This crazy guy that gets in these manic fits and tries to kill him. How easy would it have been to say, I'm done with you. You are weird. Leave me alone. I don't want anything to do with you. David has this deep respect for this man who's trying to kill him. He's a man after God's own heart. Verse 7, so David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. So not only is he not going to do it, he's protecting. How ironic, he's protecting the man that's trying to kill him. Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward, and this is the part that makes me just cry. Saul went, David also went, verse 8, went out also afterwards, went out of the cave and called out to Saul, saying, My Lord, the king! What a, what a beautiful calling. My Lord, the king! When Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. He's reverent to the king, as he should be. The same king's trying to kill him. He does, he, he's not caught up in the, well, I'll, I'll worship you, I'll respect you, king, but only if, you, if, you, if I think you deserve it. How many of us, I mean, I won't say us, but we live in a culture right now, I remember I, I cried, literally, at the inauguration of Barack Obama. And it wasn't because I was against Barack Obama or for Barack Obama. I'm not going to tell you who I was for, but what, here's what I cried about. When George Bush, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tradition, I think, I'm not a history guy, I majored in microbiology, but, but it's a tradition, I think, at the inauguration of a president in the United States that the old president flies out on Air Force, on Marine One, on the helicopter. Like, he's there for a while, and then it's like later, and it's like symbolic, like the helicopter takes off and the old president is leaving, the new president is inaugurated. And so I watched after Yo-Yo Ma did his thing on the cello, some of us remember, I watched as Marine One flew across. And you know how many, lots and lots of fingers in the crowd on the National Mall went up and flipped the bird to the, the helicopter. And I thought, I don't care what, what political party you're part of. How devastating is that? What does that tell us about our culture? I don't know about us. I've taught my kids. Michael will tell you, whatever party you're in, the president's the president. He's to be respected. And if it had been she, she would have been respected in our household, regardless whether we agreed with her or not. It's a, so there's this, this, there's this, I mean, think about the political statement that this is making, that David himself, he, you know, he could have been protesting Saul out with the pick. You know, he's down with Saul. We, we need change in Jerusalem. You know, all, all these things. He's not leading a political revolt. He's not leading a coup. He doesn't want to assassinate him. And this is the guy that wants him dead. Saul wants him dead. But what does he so, say to him? He calls him, my lord, the king. He bows down to him, his face to the earth. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, verse 9 this is, why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord, the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you. I wonder if he, I don't know if he looked back at the guy that was like, yeah. Someone urged me to kill you, but my eye spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Verse 11, moreover, my father, calls him his father. See? See the corner of your robe in my hand? And so he shows them what a man after God's own heart does in response to this sort of situation. Now I'm sure 
pretty sure that none of us in this room will ever be called upon to hide in a cave because the king's out to kill us. I hope that never happens to you. But if it does, remember what David did. The Lord was in this. I, even at the end of it, I would have been like, okay, he, he's, he's leaving. Shh, he's leaving. Let them leave. He missed us. Let him keep going. We'll stay hidden. No, no, he, he goes out, and he, I mean, he's bold enough and trusting of the Lord enough to go out and say, Saul, look. I'm, I'm, and, it, and it solves the problem. Saul, it's like, look what happens. Let the Lord judge, verse 12, let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. And he goes on, and Saul says, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to move on here, but you are, look, verse 17, this is, this is what David says, this is what Saul says, verse, verse 16, I'm sorry, go to 16, 1 Samuel 24, 16, so it was, when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, that Saul said, is this your voice, my son David? There's like this Moment of like, oh man, remember the old days we were like, buds, is this your voice? Uh, uh, and Saul lifted up his voice and wept. This is what, when the Lord solves our problems, this is the sort of thing that happens. If, if, if we're solving problems and the end result is I'm not talking to you and you're not talking to me and we just like it, fine. I don't, I don't think that's how the Lord solves problems. Maybe sometimes he does, I, I don't know. But he didn't in this case. And so he solves this problem. And at the end of it, David's not being pursued anymore. And Saul weeps and recognizes, what does he say? Then verse 17, he says to David, you are more righteous than I. Uh, true. For you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And he goes on. He recognizes that yeah, you're going to be king, dude. I, I, I see it. I see why the Lord picked you now. You're not like me. You're not like other people. You know, I can so easily, I, you know, we're, you know, we're working in a job. We, we get promoted. When somebody gets promoted over us, we're like, Ooh, why did this guy get promoted over me? I don't like that person anymore. If God is sovereign, there's no, and think about it, if God is sovereign, and He is, there's no part of our lives that He's not sovereign over. And I, I have to learn this lesson all the time. It's a hard lesson. I want to be a man after God's own heart. So I pray the Lord gives me understanding to learn this lesson. So, so David was faithful in the little things. He wasn't overcome by anxiety. He recognized that God was in his corner. He recognized God's sovereignty. And we see this in the, in the cave story. You know, <clears throat> let's move over to 2 Samuel. Got a couple more to look at and we'll be done. 2 Samuel chapter 9. We fast forwarded through a lot of stuff. <laughs> and this is just the heart of David. He's not holding a grudge. He's the king now. He's in his, he's in his, he's in his position. Saul is gone. Jonathan is gone. It's a new day. Verse uh, chapter 9, 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now David said, or verse 1, David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? What? He didn't have to do this. He, he's actively seeking a way to show the Lord's kindness to the family of the man who tried to kill him. That's hard. Now, I, I, I saw a video last year that kind of demonstrated this in the here and now. I mean, this, these are, these are, this is David and Saul and Mephibosheth, and we'll talk about that for a bit. But these, these, these things are all applicable to our lives right now. There's a story of a, of a woman in South Carolina who had a, an only child, a son, who was shot uh, by a gangbanger in the neighborhood. Bad neighborhood, things happened, and her son got killed. He's 20 years old, I think. And the killer w went to jail. They found him, devastated her whole family. He's gone. Her only child, gone. He goes to jail for like eight or ten years or whatever it was, he gets out. He can't find a job. 
So what, what, does, this, what does this mother do? This, this mother of a slain child. She goes to her son's killer, and, she, she, and you, you see the interview with her, and she's like, the Lord gave me a heart of forgiveness for this person. She goes and she says, you live with me. Move in with me, and I'll help you, I'll help you get back on your feet. And so the irony of this story, that, this, that her son's murderer moves in with her. And, and it's on YouTube. You can find, it's, it's a real story. But I, I saw it uh, uh, last year, and I thought, wow. So David gets to this spot, and he, sure enough, they find this crippled uh, kid, Mephibosheth. He's crippled in his feet, and David brings him to his table. And it's, the whole thing is as an act of kindness. It's not an act, but as a gesture of demonstrating the Lord's kindness to the family of the former king that tried to kill him. So what is, what is a man after God's own heart? He's eager to show God's kindness. He's eager to show God's kindness. So he's, he's faithful in the little things. He's not overcome by anxiety. He, he remembers in all situations that the Lord has this. He has a high regard, constant regard for God's sovereignty. He's eager to show God's kindness. I'm going to flip over a little bit to 2 Samuel. Two more verses, two more little stories, and we're done. 2 Samuel chapter 12. <clears throat> We know the story of David and Bathsheba. It's a great study. If you get into it and just re- think about it, all the layers of sin that, that David falls into here. I love this story. Why do I love this story? Because you, you can see on the one hand, there's this shepherd kid that is willing to fight the giant with the, with the nation's fate hanging in the balance. And the same guy, years later, just completely blows it and makes a, a, a terrible decision. And there's no question it's a terrible decision. And, and so we know the story. Nathan comes to him, right? And tells him this parable of the sheep and the guy takes the sheep. And, Nathan, and David's like, well, this guy needs to be killed. He's, it's terrible what he did. And Nathan's like, You're, uh, David, you pal, you did it. What's, what's David's response? Verse 13, chapter 12, verse 13. David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. He just confesses it. I don't, know about, I don't know about you. There's plenty of sins in, in my heart that I struggle with. Confessing outwardly to another human being. I confess to the Lord all the time. Confessing to the Lord, pretty easy thing to do. Lord, forgive me I did this. Forgive me I thought that. Forgive me I struggled here. Forgive me I had this thought. Forgive me I said these words. Forgive me I, whatever it is. But confessing to another person, that's a different story. I, I don't regularly do that because that's a little embarrassing. Right? A little bit vulnerable. But maybe we should confess our sins to the Lord and I think there's power in confessing them to one another as well. So I'd ask you, do you have a brother or a sister in the Lord that you're close enough? I mean, you can do it to your spouse. But I could, you know, that's awesome. It'd be awesome, Catherine. It can be, you know, I think we be weird too. You know, maybe you need a brother. You're a guy, maybe you need a brother that you can walk with. And I know, you know, what I, you know what I know, and this has been awesome because I've had kids part of the youth group and seen this. I know that this has happened and with Nick and, and Mike and some of these guys in the back. There, there have been times that they get together and I, I, and I don't know the specifics because I, you, know, you, don't, you don't push a teenager. Right? You don't like get all up in their grill. But I know this. I know that there's been times when these teenage guys have shared with one another legitimate sin. I remember, I remember a, a story. I was, in, I was part of a Bible study years and years ago before I was married to Catherine. And it was, it was time for prayer time. Prime time, time for, you know, that we're going to share prayer requests, right? And we're at Virginia Tech. And so the prayers are like, eh, nothing against these prayers. But the prayers are like, I've got a thermodynamics 2 exam tomorrow and I'm really nervous. I'm like, oh, yeah, we'll pray for you, sister. Or, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get home to Nova because uh, my car's broke. Oh, we'll pray for you. And those are legitimate prayers. We're going around the circle. I'll never forget this night. We get to this one girl, and she says, I've been in a lesbian relationship for the past year. And I'm just like, whoa! <laughs> Hang on now. That's, uh, this, that's not the kind of confession we're looking for, right? I mean, we need to keep this light. We need to keep this easy. We don't, want to, we don't want to deal with that. That's what I'm, that was my first thought. I was like, whoa, what, am I, what do we do with that? 
This is a real sin that just got confessed. You're like, whoa. Changed the whole course of the meeting. It was a breakthrough. It wasn't an embarrassment. There was more love shown in that moment to that woman than I'd seen ever in our house group. And I remember, I was like, holy cow. This was a powerful moment. And it was, she was willing to be out there with him. So David confesses his sin. So, a man or a woman after God's own heart confesses sin. And the last one, and I'll be done. And this is 1 Kings chapter 1. Still David, different book though. 1 Kings chapter 1. Here we're getting to the end of David's life. He's an old man. I love this story because I feel like an old, I feel like David right here a lot of times. He's an old man. He can't get warm. He's shivering on his bed, feeling miserable. They're loading him with blankets. So you bring a woman to snuggle up with him, platonic. But just, and he, you know, doesn't work. And you'd think right at the end of his life, here's David. He's the, God has just worked in this case. He's a man after God's own heart. Surely, surely he's going to die an easy death. Surely it's going to be an easy glide path down. You've done your job, David. Just come on in. Be joined to your, your fathers, right? Not even close. David had trouble in his kingdom right to the very end. Adonijah, his fourth son. Dad's dying, man. The throne is up for grabs. Adonijah makes a play. Like gets a crew. Starts sacrificing stuff. Come on, everybody gets like this. this uh, he's got a coup going. That father's not even dead. And his fourth son in line tries to take the throne. That's not his to take. And it catches the attention of some people. So, uh, uh, verse 11, 1 Kings 1 11, Nathan speaks to Bathsheba. They're still married. Bathsheba, not, not Adon, that's not Adonijah's mother, though. So, Nathan spoke to Bathsheba. Who's, who's Bathsheba's child? Little Solomon, right? So, uh, Nathan spoke to Bathsheba. The mother of Solomon, oh, it says, it's the mother of Solomon saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king? And David, our Lord, does not even know it. So there's this conversation going on between Nathan, the prophet, and Bathsheba, David's wife. And so they hatch this plan. We don't have time to read it all. They hatch this plan to how are we going to tell poor, dying, sick, feeble King David that there's this coup going on, and Adonijah is trying to take the throne. Oh, my goodness. What are we going to do? I can't. It's horrible. Can't. And so they make the plan, and they go. And, and, so, and, and we'll end with this. Go over to, to uh, verse 28. First Kings 1, 28. Then King David answered. So they've told him the story. Adonijah's trying to take the throne. What are we going to do, king? This is a big problem. Poor king. He's sick. He doesn't even have, he doesn't even have the peace to, to shiver in peace. He can't even shiver in peace. If I was King David, I mean, I, know, I can tell you this. I get home from work sometimes. Lay, Catherine, lay, lay on the couch. and David's like, hey, daddy, you want to go play catch? No, I, I, no, I'm tired. I don't want to play. No, I, I do it. Uh, you know, I'll, I mean, but it, can, you can be tired. You can not feel like. You know, so David doesn't say. We don't get any indication that David's like, why, why me? Why can't it just be peaceful? No, no, no. He he, he, he calls Bathsheba twenty eight. David answered and said, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And I love this because he calls his wife right before him. The king took an oath and said, and this is the part I want to focus on, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from every distress, just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Surely Solomon your son shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, so I, so I certainly will do this day. And so he, he, what is he, how does he solve this problem? He reminds his wife and himself that the Lord is living, that the Lord is faithful, that he has redeemed his, his life from every distress. He doesn't lose hope. With his dying breath, he is still trusting the Lord. So a man after God's own heart, or a woman after God's own heart, is faithful to the end. Trusting the Lord, regardless of the problem. I mean, David, let's face it, David had a miserable set of experiences here in these stories. I, I, it's nothing like what we've gone through. We, I mean... I get caught in traffic on Route 15. They're paving. I'm like, oh, my life is horrible. You know, I mean, this is the, the volume of problems that I have 
David had some horrible things happen here. Right? And at every turn, he remembers the Lord is on his side. He remembers the Lord is sovereign. He, he remembers that he's supposed to demonstrate and, and, and spread the love of God. He's eager to do that. He confesses his sin and he's faithful to the end. So those are a few things that I find in David's life that encourage me and maybe encourage you in our quest to live lives after God's own heart. And uh, may the Lord help us as we proceed. So let's pray, and I'm done. Lord, we thank you that you, uh, that you never, ever give up on us. We thank you that uh, from your standpoint, even as we sit here and as pilgrims and we wrestle with this wrestling between flesh and blood, uh, between spirit and, 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 and flesh, as we walk through this pilgrim life of ours with the problems and these jars of clay that crack. and uh, Lord, we just thank you that you're sovereign and you see things from a completely different vantage point. Lord, so we ask tonight that you'd help us to more and more, to increasingly see things from your vantage point, that we would behold your sovereignty and just rest in it, that we would, be, uh, that we would not return evil with evil, or that we would trust you in those moments we could be very, very anxious and things don't look so good. Father, that we would uh, be found faithful to the end. Well, we can only do it by your spirit. We pray you'd fill us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.